Hey there, this video is gonna be a deep dive into comparing the Panasonic S5 Mark II with the Canon R6 Mark II. So first of all, why am I making this comparison? Well, I think a lot of people are curious how these two cameras stack up against each other, and there are a lot of similarities between these two cameras, but there are also some differences, both in terms of price and features. I find that both of these are kind of like entry-level professional or prosumer-level hybrid cameras that perform really well in both photography and video, but like usual, I'll be focusing on video in this video because I don't do much photography. So if you're looking for information about the photography capabilities of these two cameras, I'll probably go out and look for a different video. Let's kick it off by talking about image quality, which is one of the most important things of any camera. So to start the discussion about the image quality with these two cameras, let's talk about the sensors. So they both have a 24.2 megapixel CMOS full frame sensor. So it's not backside illuminated, it's not stacked. So we should get fairly slow readout speeds. But with that 24.2 megapixel sensor, we get the same resolution for photography, but we also get the same resolution for video. So they both produce a 6K image that you can get with a 4K oversample. So on the S5 Mark II, you can get a 6K oversampled 4K. You can also get a 6K open gate, which we'll talk about later. Now the R6 Mark II will give you that 6K oversampled 4K, and there's supposed to be the potential of 6K raw external recording to an Ninja V and V+, but that firmware isn't out yet. So as of right now, we only have this 6K oversampled 4K in the R6 Mark II. The first test I wanna show you were some real life outdoor tests comparing these two cameras. And when I'm doing these kinds of tests, what I've been doing lately is I use the same lens on both cameras so that there is no difference uh, that's based on the lenses. We're just looking at the difference between the two cameras. And so the lens that I've been using is the lens I'm shooting on right now, which is the Sigma R EF 28 millimeter F 1.4. And I have adapters for all my cameras. So for these examples, I shot them in log. So V log on the S5 Mark II and C log three on the R6 Mark II. I graded these all by hand and I didn't use any LUTs so that you could see the difference in the colors. And you can definitely see that there is a little bit of a green shift going on on the S5 Mark II and I'll talk about this more later on in this video. But overall, the images look very similar in terms of detail and sharpness. And I'm just really impressed with the image quality out of both of these cameras. It's, and you get a lot of that detail and sharpness from that 6K oversampled 4K. Now let's get on to looking at some pixel peeping and talk about some higher resolutions because all of that was shot in 24 frames a second. I do wanna mention for these tests that the noise reduction is at the default settings for both of the cameras. So it's off in the S5 Mark II and in the standard setting in the R6 Mark II. Now I made a detailed video about my about testing these cameras for low light and I talk in depth about noise reduction in that video, so you should definitely check that out. But overall, I would say they're very similar in terms of detail and sharpness and you will see a little bit more of that chroma noise in the S5 Mark II. So starting with 4K24, as I said, comparing these two cameras, they both shoot full frame 4K24. They look very similar, both in terms of detail, sharpness, and noise. Really no surprises there because as I was looking at the outdoor examples, they look very similar in terms of that stuff in 4K24. Now let's talk about slow motion. There's one big difference between these two cameras and it has to do with 4K60. So in the S5 Mark II, when you shoot in 4K60, you're forced into an APS-C crop. You cannot shoot full frame 4K60. Whereas in the R6 Mark II, that is one of its biggest selling features is that you can shoot a 6K oversampled 4K60 in full frame with no crop. So taking a look here, when you compare these two images, the R6 Mark II looks better. Of course, you're getting that full frame 6K oversampled 4K image. So it's really no surprise here that the R6 Mark II is gonna look better than the uh, 4K60 crop mode, which is probably a one-to-one -one readout. What I wanted to do then is compare 4K60 crop mode on both cameras because you do have the option of shooting 4K60 crop on the R6 Mark II. And for this comparison, I would say that they looked pretty similar in terms of detail, sharpness, and noise. I would maybe give a slight advantage to the R6 Mark II, but they were very, very similar. And if you wanna look at 120 frames per second, you can't do that in 4K on either of these two cameras. So what I did was I wanted to compare them in 1080p. And so taking a look here, these are full frame 1080p 120 on both cameras. They look pretty similar. And again, maybe a slight advantage to the R6 Mark II. Now, one thing I wanna point out about 1080p 120 on the R6 Mark II is that you have to put in high frame rate mode and then you're forced into that mode, which only spits out in 30 frames per second with no audio. Whereas when you shoot 120 frames per second on the S5 II, it shoots normally and at normal speed and you get audio. So I just wanted to point that out. But overall, in terms of image quality, uh, detail and sharpness, et cetera, these cameras are very similar in all of their modes. So really very comparable in terms of image quality. So I wanna talk for a moment about the color shift that's going on with V-Log. And I did mention this when I was talking about the outdoor examples. The V-Log has a little bit of a green color shift even when you use a custom white balance, which anytime I'm doing any indoor tests or any of the recording stuff that I do in the studio here, I always use a custom white balance. 
So here's an example uh, right out of camera. There's a little bit of a green shift and then I applied the technical conversion a lot and then adjusted the contrast saturation colors a little bit to get it a little bit nicer. I've also experimented with not using the technical a lot and just adding a magenta shift to the tint to adjust the skin tones, but then it throws off the rest of the image. So just be aware of this, that there is a green color shift in V-Log on the S5 Mark II. A lot of people have asked me in the past where you get a technical conversion lot or what is a technical conversion lot. So first of all, what it is, is it just takes the log image and converts it to Rec. 709 so you can work with it in your color space in your NLE. And where you can get this, well, some NLEs, it's built in. You can just apply it in there or you can get them directly from the camera manufacturers. They all supply technical conversion lots to take it from their log images to Rec. 709 so you can just Google it and look for it. But I'll leave a link down below for the V-Log LUT. I really don't like the Canon technical LUTs because the C-Log 3 conversion LUT was based on a much older camera and it makes it look way more magenta. So I usually wind up grading that by hand. But I think the V-Log LUT definitely helps here, but it does take some adjustments with the colors afterwards. Whereas I find a lot of the colors coming out of like the R6 Mark II, A7 IV, et cetera, are a lot more accurate just right out of camera. Now let's talk about the low light or high ISO performance of these two cameras. I made a whole dedicated video about this comparing the performance of the S5 Mark II with the R6 Mark II and the A7 IV. So if you're interested in checking out more of the details with the low light test and how I perform the test, definitely go check that video. I'll leave that link down below. I do wanna point out that the R6 Mark II really does benefit from overexposing by about one or one and a third stops, but I wanted to test both cameras with their recommended exposure that is given by the manufacturers based on their own log curves. If you're curious about why I decided about the overexposure for the R6 Mark II, again, I made a whole detailed video about that. I'll leave that video linked down below. So the S5 Mark II has a dual base ISO of 640 and 4000 in V-Log, whereas the R6 Mark II does not have a dual base ISO, but definitely has some cleaning up going on at 3200, so I'll call that an informal second base ISO when you're shooting in C-Log 3. Now, in the lower ISO range, the S5 Mark II has less luminoids, but has more chrominoids, and the R6 Mark II's noise reduction takes care of the chrominoids, which I talked about in another video about noise reduction, which I'll leave linked down below. Now, throughout the ISO range, the S5 Mark II has more chrominoids, as I said, but the R6 Mark II definitely cleans up at 3200, and the S5 II cleans up at 4000, which of course is the second base of the S5 II. Now up to 5000, they're pretty similar in terms of luminoids, but the chrominoids is worse on the S5 II. 6400 and up, the R6 Mark II is nicer. It might be from the noise reduction. As you can see, there's some smoothing and loss of detail. But overall, at the manufacturer's recommended exposure, the S5 Mark II is a bit cleaner in terms of luminoids, but worse in terms of chrominoids. Next, let's talk about dynamic range. I didn't do my usual latitude or push-pull test, but what I did include is the normal example that I do of me standing next to a bright window in a dark room. The way that I do this test is I expose as high as I possibly can to not clip the highlights and then look into the shadows. I manually graded both these clips here and I didn't use a technical LUT, but you can definitely clearly see that the S5 II has more dynamic range, but you also get that green color shift, which I mentioned before because I didn't use the technical LUT, but definitely a huge advantage here for the S5 II. You can definitely see that in this example. And this is backed up from some of the lab tests that were reported from CineD. So you can check out on their website that the R6 Mark II has 10.8 stops of usable dynamic range in the 6K oversampled 4K full frame mode. And the S5 II has 12.3 stops in the 6K open gate and 12.4 stops in the 6K oversampled 4K and similar results in the APS-C modes as well. So clearly the S5 II is better in terms of dynamic range and from those lab tests that I referenced, they're about one and a half stops and I can definitely see that in the example that I showed you. And I'm still waiting on the 6K external raw recording uh, capabilities of the, S the R6 Mark II when that firmware comes out for the Ninja V and V+. I'm really curious if it's a limitation of the sensor or the fact that this only shoots in C-Log 3 and not C-Log 2, but for now, I have no way of knowing. So clearly the S5 II has a, a serious advantage in terms of dynamic range. Now let's talk about stabilization. And most of you watching this probably know that Panasonic has class leading stabilization, but I really wanted to see how the R6 Mark II stacked up against the S5 Mark II. So for these tests, I use native lenses because I think that'll make the system work a lot better than using adapted lenses. So on the R6 Mark II, I use my RF 24 to 70 F 2.8, which does have image stabilization. And that's something that I use because it's available in a lot of the RF lenses, whereas a lot of the Lumix lenses don't have stabilization that are available at the moment. So one thing you have to remember about the stabilization of the Canon systems is you can either have the lens stabe and IBIS on or both off. You can't have one or the other on or off. Now on the S5 II, I use two different lenses, the Lumix 24 F1.8 and the 50 F1.8 
for the two different examples, and those do not have stabilization. Now for the walking test, what I did here is I was just holding the camera by the lens and not being super careful. So taking a look here with no stabilization to get a sense of what's going on, and then applying IBIS, which is also includes the lens stabilization on the R6 Mark II, and then IBIS plus the electronic stabilization on both cameras. And what I noticed is they both performed really, really well. And I think the R6 Mark II held up pretty well to the S5 II. Maybe the S5 II is a little bit better. Now there's been a lot of criticism about Canon's IBIS system at super wide focal lengths. And I think that's because the IBIS system is very strong and you get those wobbles on the wide ends, which you definitely get on other camera manufacturer systems as well. Now, I've talked about this in other videos and shown this in examples, but I don't have a wider lens at the moment to test the S5 Mark II. So I've seen other people out there talking about it and that it's not as bad as the Canon system. But overall, I would say for the walking test, I'd have to give a slight edge to the S5 Mark II, but the R6 Mark II really did hold, in the, hold up really, really well. Now for static shots, this was a little bit different. So I tested these at 50 millimeters and you can see here what it looks like without any stabilization, I'm just holding it in front of my body. When I applied IBIS, they looked pretty similar, but the big difference here is when you use the electronic stabilization and the boost mode in the S5 II, that's where the S5 II really starts to shine because it looks a lot steadier and you have a lot less of a crop. So overall, I have to give an edge to the S5 II for that incredible static shot stabilization, almost looks like a tripod but I really do like the uh, stabilization system in the R6 Mark II, especially with a stabilized lens. I think it performs really, really well. Next, let's talk about rolling shutter. For this test, I did this in 4K24, both doing a 6K oversampled 4K full frame, and I used a native lens at 50 millimeters with stabilization turned off. And you can see here that the R6 Mark II is a little bit better than the S5 Mark II. Neither of these cameras are great, but you get a, I would give a slight advantage to the R6 Mark II. And again, referring to Cine D's lab test, they got the rolling shutter of the R6 Mark II at 16 and a half milliseconds versus 22 milliseconds on the S5 Mark II. And that was in the full frame 4K, 25 frames per second. And in APS-C modes, it was similar at 10.3 and 14.3 milliseconds. So slight edge here for better rolling per shutter performance on the R6 Mark II. Now we'll talk about overheating and battery life. Now both of these have pretty similar battery life in my experience, so not much of a difference there. But in terms of overheating, there is a difference because the S5 Mark II has a fan in it and it has forced cooling, which the R6 Mark II just has passive cooling. Now, one thing you wanna keep in mind about the S5 II is it shouldn't overheat because of the fan, but make sure you also change the recording max temperature to high. And to find this, you go into the menu under wrench, monitor to display, thermal management, and set it to high. And then the S5 Mark II will not overheat. Now, I have not had any issues with the R6 Mark II in 4K24, but it definitely will overheat in 4K60. So overall, in terms of battery life, very similar, but for overheating and long run times, I would definitely have to give an advantage to the S5 Mark II because it has a fan in it. Next, let's talk about autofocus. And this is a huge deal because Panasonic debuted their phase detect autofocus system in the S5 Mark II. Now there are a lot of ways to test autofocus and frankly that would be a very long and detailed video, but I'll try to sum it up here a little bit in my experience so far using the S5 Mark II over the past month or so, and also show you a few examples. But I do have to say that overall, the R6 Mark II's autofocus is slightly better. Now I noticed when I was recording my studio tour video, which you have, if you haven't seen, I'll leave that video linked down below. I talk about all the gear I use, and there's a lot of cool ideas in there. You should definitely go check that out. But what I noticed was that the S5 II lost autofocus on me a few times when I was just talking to the camera in a well-lit situation. Now, for me personally, I do use these cameras to film myself often. So if it's losing autofocus on me when I'm just talking to the camera, not doing anything crazy, that's an issue for me. So I just wanted to report on that. So for all this stuff, I use the default autofocus settings and there's two different tests I wanna show you here. One of which is just a face eye detect situation where I'm talking to the camera. And just to show you here where the S5 II struggles is when your hands kind of go in front of your face. And for me personally, I do talk a lot with my hands. And so I can't have the camera losing autofocus on me when I'm either moving around or something like my hands are going in front of my face and stuff like that. So that's something here where the R6 Mark II is doing a little bit better than the S5 II. I noticed that again during that um, studio tour video and also during a live stream where I was using the S5 Mark II. One other test that I did with the autofocus was I wanna test the touch tracking autofocus. And the way I did this is I set up a slider with a little Lego Grogu on there to move back and forth so I could have consistent movements. Now this is a very tough uh, demanding test for any camera because it's constantly having to make adjustments as the object is moving for uh, away from the camera and closer to the camera. Now, both struggled at different times and you can see here that neither of them are perfect, but I have to give a slight edge to the R6 Mark II overall, but I definitely think that the S5 II did 
really, really well here and was pretty competitive with the R6 Mark II. One thing I noticed when I was doing this and looking at the back of the screens was that the R6 Mark II tracked a lot better and it definitely like grabbed onto the shape of the of the object versus the S5 II definitely just kept it in one spot for most of the time. And I think that was mainly because Grogu in, in that motion was kind of in the same spot. But I noticed that the R6 Mark II definitely tracked a lot better. If that related to or translated to better autofocus performance, I didn't really see that. But if it was a more complex motion in terms of where the subject was moving in the frame, I think the R6 Mark II would have done better. One thing I want to point out about the autofocus system in the S5 II is that the phase detect autofocus does not work when you're shooting in full frame 1080p at 50 or 60 frames per second and up. Now, I haven't tested this, but I've seen plenty of other people online document this. So you need to be aware of that. Now, if you're shooting in 4K 60, on the S5 II, you do get the phase detect system because it's in crop mode. So again, full frame at 1080p at 50 or 60 frames a second and up on the S5 II, you lose phase detect autofocus. Overall, I am really impressed with the first version of Panasonic's phase detect autofocus, but it's definitely not quite at the same level as Canon or Sony. Now there might be firmware updates or future cameras where it gets better. And I really do think that their phase detect system will improve. As I said, this is their first shot at it. Whereas Canon and Sony have been doing phase detect autofocus for many years and have many iterations on it. So overall though, if you really rely on autofocus, I have to give an edge to the Canon R6 Mark II. Next, let's talk about build quality and ergonomics. The build quality is great on both cameras. They have a different feel to them, but I like them both for different reasons. The S5 II definitely has a more like metal body and like really sturdy feel to it, but the R6 Mark II is just very comfortable to hold. I have to say that they it's great that they both have three exposure controls and you don't always see that in every camera nowadays, so I really like to have that. But let's start by talking about the tops. Take a look at the tops of the cameras here. They have some differences, but one thing I do like is that they both have the power switches on the right-hand side. So when you're holding the camera by the grip, you can easily turn them on and off. I absolutely love that location. The big differences here are the fact that there are dedicated white balance and ISO buttons down here, which are really, really cool to have. And one thing I like about the R6 Mark II is it has a dedicated photo video switch, which I love because you can just leave it one more or the other and then just change the mode dial. So a little bit of differences there in terms of the top. In terms of the backs of the cameras, they have very similar layouts. There's a couple of differences. One is this, this guy right here, which is a really clever way of controlling the uh, autofocus settings. There's a dial here to change it from the different settings. And then if you press the button in the middle, you can toggle between all the different settings. So it's a really quick way of jumping in there and changing the autofocus settings or changing it to manual focus and stuff like that. They both have a Q menu, but one thing I do like about the S5 II is that you can put a lot more stuff in there and it's a lot more customizable. The LCD screens on these two cameras are a little bit different. The R6 Mark II has a three inch 1.62 million dot. The S5 Mark II is a three inch 1.84 million dot. Even though the S5 Mark II has a higher resolution screen in practice when I'm shooting outside, I definitely prefer the screen on the R6 Mark II, even when the brightness is set all the way up. Canon just does a great job with their LCD screens. They're a lot easier to see and just the colors look great and all that kind of stuff. In terms of the EVFs, very similar. They have a 3.69 million dot uh, EVF and a 3.68 million dot. So pretty similar in terms of that. Now onto the grip side of the cameras. They both have a very nice deep grip, very easy to hold. And I do like both of them a lot. One thing I wanna point out here is that the remote port is on this side of the S5 II, whereas the remote port is on the other side of the R6 Mark II. In terms of memory cards, they both use dual SD cards. So you have the option for dual recording, relay recording, all that kind of stuff. In terms of the ports on both of these cameras, they are very, very similar, except for one big difference, micro HDMI and full size HDMI. And the S5 II has a full size HDMI port, which is awesome. I'm gonna complain about this every single time I can. We need full size HDMI ports in our hybrid cameras. They make a huge difference for videographers. Other than that, very similar. They both have a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack and mic jack. They both have USB-C. As I said before, the remote port is on this side on the R6 Mark II versus on the grip side on the S5 Mark II. And I do wanna talk about the batteries for a second. So they both have pretty similar batteries, both in terms of size and capacity. And one thing I do wanna say though, is when you buy the S5 II, it doesn't actually come with an actual battery charger. You have to buy that separately, whereas the Canon camera does. So keep that in mind. You can charge it through USB, but if you're looking for an actual battery charger, the S5 II does not come with one. And it's an extra, I think like 80 bucks if you wanna get the, uh, the proper one. So again, very similar in terms of size and the capacity, they're both 16 watt hours. So let's talk about what's the same between these two cameras. 
They both shoot in 4K 10-bit 422 IPB or long op. They don't shoot in all eye or in raw at the time being. They have a very similar body design with a flippy screen and they both can shoot in an APS-C crop mode in 4K, which is a 1.6 times on the R6 Mark II and 1.5 times on the S5 Mark II. And you can also get the XLR adapter. This fits in the hot shoe, so if you need professional audio, there is a solution to get both of those directly into the camera. Now let's talk about what's different between these two cameras because there's quite a bit of differences. The big one first is the 4K60. So full frame 4K60, which is a 6K or simple 4K in the R6 Mark II versus the cropped 4K60 in the S5 Mark II. The S5 II has 6K open gate. And first of all, that's a 10 bit 420, not 10 bit 422, but it definitely looks amazing. So if you're not familiar with open gate, what that is is a full uh, readout of the sensor. So usually when you're recording video on a hybrid camera, you'll get a 16 by nine or 17 by nine aspect ratio and it cuts off the top and the bottom. But on cameras like the S5 Mark II and some of the Fuji cameras, you get a full three by two readout of the sensor. So it's actually the whole sensor. And it's really cool for a few reasons. One of which is just a really cool um, aspect ratio to play with because it looks very different. But also you have a lot more height. So if you need to crop for vertical video, you have additional pixels there and just makes you have a lot more flexibility. And I wish all camera manufacturers offer this. I definitely hope we see Canon and Sony offering this in the future. The S5 II has a whole bunch of video focus features like waveform and shutter angle, both of which I'd love to have in any camera. You can also put custom LUTs into the S5 II, both for viewing in camera and it can put out over HDMI. So if you're monitoring on a monitor or live streaming or something like that, you can put your own LUT in there. It also offers anamorphic D-squeeze and IBIS for anamorphic. So lots of anamorphic support in the S5 II, which is definitely not in the R6 Mark II. You also get a DCI option, so 17 by nine versus only 16 by nine or UHD in the R6 Mark II. In terms of codecs, they are very similar, but they're only offering the IPB or long op, but as of you know what they said, we will eventually get the 6K external recording option in the R6 Mark II. Of course, there is the S5 Mark II X, which is coming out eventually, which will offer some other codec options, but I'm just talking about these two cameras right here. The R6 Mark II also has focus breathing compensation and false color, which I'm kind of surprised the S5 Mark II does not have false color. Overheating is not a concern on the S5 II because it has the built-in fan. And the S5 Mark II also has a full-size HDMI port, which is really cool. So what do you get when you go with the R6 Mark II over the S5 Mark II? Well, you get that oversampled full frame 4K60. You also get phase detect autofocus in all frame rates and modes, which you don't have to worry about which mode you're in and how the autofocus is gonna work. You also get false color and focus breathing compensation. You also get 6K external raw recording when it becomes available. It's not available at the moment. And you get better overall autofocus performance. And one thing I wanna say is that the shutter closes at shutdown, which is a huge feature that I love. I don't know why the S5 Mark II doesn't have that. I wish all cameras had that because it makes a huge difference when you're changing lenses out in the field. So what do you get with the S5 Mark II over the R6 Mark II? Well, you get more dynamic range, which is a big deal to me. You also get all those video functions, shutter angle, waveform, custom lots, anamorphic support, DCI, open gate, and a lot more options for codecs and frame rates and all that kind of stuff. And you also get the full size HDMI port, no overheating and better stabilization for static shots. So a lot of big advantages for shooting video on the S5 Mark II. Now onto my final conclusions, pricing, recommendations, all that kind of stuff. First of all, we'll talk about the price. So $2,000 for the S5 Mark II, $2,500 for the R6 Mark II. That's not insignificant. $500 can buy you another lens, lighting, accessories, all that kind of stuff. Now, after using the S5 II for a while and doing all these tests, I thought it'd be more clear between these two cameras, but it's really tough. I think it really depends a lot on how you'll be using the camera. So the S5 II is definitely more video focused, which I've been talking about throughout this video and has a lot more video features, also has a lot more dynamic range. But the combination of having the crop 4K60 and no phase detect autofocus for 1080p60 for me personally makes this harder to use because the autofocus is less reliable overall, but also in 1080p60. So one thing I'm doing right now is I'm doing my client work is uh, real estate stuff and I shoot in 60 frames a second. So for me, I don't wanna have crop 4K60 and I need to have reliable autofocus. So that specific use case, for, use case for me personally makes it really hard to use the S5 Mark II unless I'm using manual focus in 1080p60, which I don't wanna do. So that makes a difference for my personal work. But again, depends on what you're doing. Overall though, if you need more reliable autofocus, I would definitely recommend the R6 Mark II. If you're doing 
um, a lot of a lot more run and gun stuff, or you're shooting yourself often, I'm gonna trust the the autofocus more in the Canon. Anytime you're trying to decide on buying a camera, you should always think about lenses and the overall ecosystem. So you can adapt lenses to both of these systems, and you know I've been using the Sigma MC21 to adapt the Sigma 28 millimeter art, which I talked about before, and it works really well on this camera. I find that Sigma EF lenses will work really well with the Sigma adapters. I've seen online with people adapting EF lenses as well with mixed results. So again, your mileage may vary, but if you're adapting EF lenses, they'll work really well on the R6 Mark II. But also think about in terms of the native lenses that are available. So if you're looking to get a lens for the S5 Mark II, it's part of the Elmont Alliance. So you have companies like Leica, Lumix, and Sigma making lenses for the Elmont. So you have a few options there. And for Canon, as of right now, they're the only people making autofocus lenses for the RF system. So depending on your needs, one might be better than the other. It's debatable. There are a lot of great lenses available in the Lumix system, but there are definitely some holes as well. The prime lenses are, I think, a great value, the 24 1.8, which we talked about, and also the 50 1.8. There's a few zoom lenses. Sigma makes some great zoom lenses, but overall, just take a, a big look at the ecosystem and try to figure out what's gonna be better for you. I don't really know what's gonna happen down the road in terms of what lenses are gonna come out. I think Canon is gonna come out with more RF lenses, but we don't know at the moment. So as I said, it's really tough to know what both Canon and Panasonic are gonna be coming out with in the future in terms of bodies and lenses. So sometimes it's really hard to decide on which system to invest in. Now, if you're a Canon user and you're watching this video, you might be wondering, should I switch from Canon to Panasonic with the new S5 II? Well, I know a lot of you are frustrated with the Canon system. If you're a video shooter, there's a lot of features that are lacking. It feels like there's some cripples, yeah, the lack of third-party lens options. So there's a lot of frustration out there in terms of video shooters in the Canon system. But in my opinion, if you're heavily invested in a Canon, you may not wanna switch just yet, but it really depends on what's important to you. If autofocus is important, if you're doing a lot of run and gun stuff, you're feeling yourself a lot, the, the autofocus system in the R6 II or in the Canon system is gonna be more reliable, in my opinion, as of right now, than the S5 II. If you're behind the camera more, using manual focus lenses, you need all those, those uh, advanced video features, then the S5 II is an awesome option. But remember, Buy a camera for what it does now, not what it might do later with an update. I think for a lot of people, me personally, I'm really excited about Panasonic's phase detect autofocus system, and I think it will get better over time. But you have to buy a camera for what it can do now because it may not get updated or may not get better, so definitely keep that in mind. All right, there was a lot of in this video for you to think about between these two cameras and these two systems, so hopefully you enjoyed this, and if you did, please consider hitting subscribe down below. It'd be greatly appreciated. Thank you so much for watching, and see you in the next one.